to the Michael O'Donnell Lecture Theatre here for both our people of the Polish community who may be here, people from the Royal Aeronautical Society, and our own students within the IT. Um, today I have the pleasure of, of introducing Professor Wiesla uh, Binienda. I'll get it right, I'm still trying it for the last while, but I'll get it right. From the University of Akron, okay, in Ohio. And in, he has come here uh, under the invite of the Polish Discussion Group in Ireland and the Royal Aeronautical Society, and with the help of DIT, to discuss the characterization and modeling of aerospace materials and structures. The professor himself is director of the Gas Turbine Research and Testing Laboratory in the university and also Chief Editor of the Journal of Aerospace Engineering. Um, among many of his accolades is the NASA Prize for Turning Goals into Reality Award for his research. And also he's had other, numerous other uh, accolades, which he couldn't tell you more about than I could. But uh, basically what we will do is in, in normal operations here, we'll uh, let the professor get on to his lecture and after the lecture we'll have a quick question and answer session for everybody. So, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome the professor here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you all Irish people for inviting me here to Dublin. Um, I had a chance uh, uh, yesterday and the day before to try your beer. I have to say, very good. <laughs> Um, the weather uh, is iffy, you know, it's uh, every day something else, so um, I, I, I know that uh, uh, this is not uh, uh, the best uh, in, in January or February to come here to Ireland, uh, but uh, I heard that the summer is much better. Um, in my presentation today, I'm going to uh, uh, present kind of two parts. The, the first part will be uh, uh, fundamental research that we conducted um, recently, um, and the, um, the later on it will be applied uh, this methodology to a particular problem. The, the problem that, that uh, the methodology is going to be applied is to be a crash of the aircraft that uh, I will discuss in the second half of, the, of my presentation. Um, in terms of uh, uh, advanced materials, everybody knows that you know our original materials that, that are still flying in our aircrafts are uh, aluminum uh, alloys. Uh, but uh, recently, more and more, they are replaced by composite materials. So, uh, in our group, uh, we uh, decided to uh, try to understand and develop technology for co uh, braided composite materials with the uh, graphite fibers. And you can see on the uh, right the big braider and effect of the braider that is used. Um, uh, to produce the containment system for the jet engine. Um, we started this work uh, in 2000 and uh, over the time uh, we developed a, a very strong material. I have a sample here, so if anybody would like to, to come and see how, how, how light it is and how strong it is, you, you are welcome. Uh, basically, uh, the idea is that the uh, outside section of the uh, jet engine, the front part of the fan, has to be protected by a, a cylinder shape uh, structure that is capable to withstand impact of the blade uh, if it is released at the maximum RPM of the jet engine. This is required by FAA and uh, um, you can see here the, the, the test that every jet engine is got, it has to um, uh, pass. Uh, it is called blade out test uh, for the uh, jet engine like the GE90. Uh, it costs more than 20 million dollars. So if you can imagine the, the test that um, you, this is a, in particular Rolls Royce engine and, and, and is conducted in England. Uh, this test, but uh, the same test is done by other companies like uh, GE or Honeywell or Pratt and Whitney, 
and other compounds. So the test, as you saw, was very quick. You know, it was just a millisecond. And of course, we use uh, high-speed cameras uh, that is videotaping that. But even with the high-speed cameras, uh, we can only see a little bit of, of the action. Uh, it's very hard to measure, and I think, because the energy involved in those tests. So um, um, you can imagine that, that basically the, 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 the prototype of the engine, which is expensive on its, in its own, is basically destroyed during this test. Um, now, uh, as I mentioned, the, the, this is the uh, required test by for certification. So um, companies, they have to do it, but they don't like to do it too many of those tests, okay? Because if they can uh, limit to one or two, then they are very happy. If uh, this test would not pass, of course, then they have a big trouble because then they have to go back to the drawing boards and they have to continue um, making modification to the design and slowing down the process of delivering the, the, uh, uh, you know, the product, it costs even more money. So what they do, they uh, over-design. You know, that is normal. And uh, if they over-design, the engine is heavier and, and uh, we pay for that, all, all of us who are flying airplanes, because then the tickets are <laughs> more expensive. Um, so the idea was to replace the heaviest part of, the, of this engine, which is that uh, containment system, by the material that is much lighter, and this is what we succeeded by uh, using this braided material. So we have started to develop technology from the material point of view, and that we have to characterize, understand, be able to de uh, uh, describe mathematically and physically through a system of tests and then develop the uh, fabrication process that would be automated so the, the system can be done again and again with the same quality. Um, so, so this is the containment system <coughs> and uh, basically uh, it's flying with the engine and, and uh, it's a dead weight until it's necessary to stop this fragment of the blade uh, to penetrate the engine and, and, of course, to protect the wing of the airplane or, or the fuselage of the airplane and, and, uh, and make possible, even in such situation that the blade is broken, uh, for the airplane to land. Um, in order to understand uh, the, the, the whole system, we had to look into it from the material point of view of the micro, a level, meso level, and macro level, and also on the structural level. So this is the so-called multi-scale approach and the required to analyze and, and characterize the polymer itself that is used as a matrix in the composite, the composite itself as a micro-mechanical point from the micro-mechanical point of view, then <coughs> understanding the architecture of the material, which is the meso-mechanical uh, uh, level, then go into laminate, which is the macro-mechanical level, and, and make a structure, which is the structural level. The, uh, we use um, um, different um, uh, matrix materials and uh, limited ourselves to 700 um, torus T700S fiber, which is Japanese uh, uh, fiber, and uh, you can see architecture, and again, you know, the same architecture is uh, seen here in the sample, uh, which has three directions of the fiber. It's uh, zero embedded uh, inside of the bundles, and plus minus 60 uh, braided over and under uh, through the system of, of braiding. So this in uh, mechanics of composite, we call it quasi-isotropic material. It means that uh, from the point of view theory, it's supposed to have the same properties in axial direction, which is this one, as in transverse direction. Um, of course, when we uh, test, you can see that at different level, we will uh, focus on, on different mode of failure. You know, we can see that the uh, micro-mechanical level, the uh, uh, adhesive or cohesive fracture of the, of the material itself. We can see from the um, 
uh, sample level, uh, the uh, tension results, which uh, looks like shear, and from the uh, structural level, we can see the damage due to uh, um, apply application of the internal pressure, which makes the crack uh, driven by the structure uh, geometry of uh, you know cylindrical structure itself. So. Um, in order to characterize the resin material, uh, we uh, developed special uh, small uh, samples that we could get the results under tension, compression, and torsion for the shear. So we had a small uh, cylinder and we used a digital image correlation technique to observe the deformation of this material. I'm sure uh, in your uh, university you use uh, digital image correlation widely it used to be uh, you know uh, advanced method of measurement but right now it's very common so i'm not going to discuss that the small tube uh, is shown here is of course for the torsion and below is empty inside uh, and uh, the tube of that kind can be used uh, for the static test as well for the hopkinson bar test uh, for the high rate strain rate so we can see the results of the uh, rate, strain rate testing that the higher the, uh, the uh, rate of deformation, the different stress strain relationship you can get. And uh, it is basically uh, elastic and uh, plastic material. You can get as high as 50% strain for the resin itself. Now, because of the viscoelastic uh, properties, if you load and unload, you can get characteristics uh, of this um, uh, test, which means some of the energy would be absorbed through just test, uh, loading and unloading. And all of that is important because we eventually have to develop the, a constitutive equation that would de uh, describe this behavior of the uh, uh, polymer composite that we use in this um, <coughs> material uh, application, uh, so we use the uh, uh, modified definition of Drucker Prager yield criterion for the um, to account for hydrostatic stress effect presenting the polymers and strain rate dependent elastic, and uh, the, basically this is the some mathematics that describe the stress strain using the compliance uh, matrix uh, um, and the. Uh, uh, Functions that that uh, use in the in the um, constitutive equations. I'm not going to spend all the time, but basically this is quite simple uh, for the constitutive equation um, system, but still has seven uh, parameters that need to be determined experimentally. And of course, this is not uh, uh, finished. We also have to uh, uh, add some damage uh, that is uh, involved in the material itself uh, as a matrix. So the damage is reducing the um, strain, uh, Young's modulus, you can see that uh, the more the damage, the different slope, even at the beginning of the, of the stress-strain curve is uh, obtained, and that need to be related mathematically. Um, and it was captured using the damage parameter, um, which is uh, basically defined using Kachanov type of definition. Um, the uh, revised um, model is described here by this uh, equation, where you have effective strain and damage parameter involving uh, in this uh, equation, and therefore you can have the sensitivity to the behavior of the material, not just as a, a virgin material, as it, as it is new, but also when it is uh, uh, damaged. And uh, uh, we developed U UMAT for LS Dyna, which is basically a system of steps that uh, will incorporate this uh, model into the uh, 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 finite element calculations, and the bottom, bottom line is to have experimental data and um, simulations and convince yourself that yes, you capture the behavior of, of, of this material at different strain rates and, and you have it um, 
um, that you can use, you can go, you can move on to next step uh, of the analysis. Um, uh, one addition to the uh, to, uh, uh, behavior of the resin material is that it uh, um, unfortunately suffers aging during the uh, lifetime application. So it means that when we produce the composite and we uh, put it into airplane and it flies and it changes temperature from uh, temperature at the tarmac to the uh, cruise temperature, which is very cold, and then lands maybe in Hawaii and it's very hot and humid, uh, or in uh, Dublin, uh, which is also <laughs> more, could be very humid. Uh, then uh, all these conditions um, and the application of, of different gases can um, um, re deteriorate the material uh, behavior. So we were asked to uh, use our laboratory, we have special environmental chamber where we uh, submitted this material uh, to the aging uh, process and we tested again and again after months, two months, uh, one year, two years, three years, four years, and find out if this material is uh, going to behave properly at the end of life. Because the designer people, you, you, you know, it's easy to, to get the properties of the material when it is produced. You can go to the uh, laboratory and test just after fabrication. But as a designer, you have to design the part, the structure, at the end of life, because it has to uh, um, efficiently behave and do the job at the end of life, not at the beginning of life. So we found that indeed uh, the aging is changing properties of, of resin from very uh, uh, elastic plastic to less plastic and to very brittle material. It changes also the, the color, as you can see, through the, the cross-section of the broken uh, specimen. So, um, once you understand the, the uh, limitation in the behavior of the resin itself, then you can go and, and make a composite, and then um, you go and try to test the composite. Of course, uh, from the testing point of view, they are ASTM standard tests. I don't know what test you use here in, in um, uh, Ireland, but in the United States, ASTM is, is the way that we follow. Unfortunately, this is a coupon of the uh, simple tensial test, and you can see that uh, the edges, the outside edges, basically cuts through the bundles that are plus minus 60. And this has, uh, we found, a consequence on the results of the test. So we had to develop a new test outside of ASTM standard, and uh, we were looking for, um, to, first of all, to understand so-called edge effect, and you can see this edge effect in, in the DIC methodology. This is experiment that you can see the uh, uh, edge effect uh, which gives different stresses than they are uh, inside. And of course, non-homogeneous non stresses or strains visible, like you can see uh, maybe uh, damage, local damage, split or, or, or fracture or debanding between fiber and maintenance. All of that uh, uh, can be overlap on the global stress strain, but locally, uh, they produce different stress strain relationship and they need to be uh, known and, and uh, somehow incorporate into constitutive equation later in the, in the modeling. So um, we spent a number of uh, uh, years to understand the different uh, failure modes. Uh, we found uh, through the thickness, the uh, uh, splitting of the bundle that are shown circled, and we look at the uh, microscope, we look at the, the banding at the fiber level, and uh, we found that even for the same fiber, uh, but two different resin, which globally gives almost similar uh, behavior, the local uh, uh, stress strain can reproduce different uh, damage progression or, uh, or, or, or behavior of the material itself. We 
attribute that um, uh, to uh, uh, interface. Okay, we can have material with strong interface that is on the left, and with the weaker interface which is on the right. So although we combine materials that uh, physically behave almost the same, but because of the interface, the effect could be quite different. And again, um, a, a, a lot of tests that uh, uh, showing the uh, mode of failure under tension. And this is this uh, um, uh, uh, pictures from the high-speed cameras that show how quickly, um, this is uh, 40,000 frames per second. So within 12 uh, frames of the 40,000 frames per second, you can see the damage progression. So you have to capture that very quickly. Otherwise, you don't see that at all. Um, and then uh, all these tests are put together in the mesomechanical model, which is um, shown here, a mic micromechanical model. For micromechanical model, we divided uh, a brace, so called representative volume element, to subsections A, B, C, D. And in section, subsection or subcell A and C, uh, they are uh, fibers in plus, minus, and zero degrees. Uh, orientation and then B and C are plus minus 60 in different orientation. And for the mesomechanical model, the idea was to use solid um, uh, elements. For micromechanical model, was to use shell element. And uh, of course, shell element will uh, lose some of the information that uh, the solid element can provide. But for the structural analysis. The shell element is the proper way to do it, not solid, uh, solid elements. So again, uh, all the, all the um, way of uh, in contributing this to, um, to the model with the cohesive element used for, for to measure the uh, strength of the interface. And of course, those people who understand fraction mechanics, you know, mode one, mode two, mode three, and they are all captured in a um, cohesive element. And the bottom line is that you have then a significant number of parameters you can adjust and make sure that the simulation, as you can see here, for the axial tension, transverse tension, axial compression, and transverse compression will capture the a experiment as, as measured in the laboratory. And also you can uh, uh, look at the, into the analysis and try to understand if you capture not only the uh, slope stress strain relationship, but also you can capture the damage. And this is on the left simulation and on the right um, experiment, which, which really indeed captures those um, failures that occur in the material itself. And, and, and again, for other tests are shown here. Uh, same thing you do for macromechanical model, and eventually uh, you can get the uh, tests and um, uh, samples that, that, that gives the uh, good, good results uh, for the macromechanical tests. These are tons of tons of tests, so I'm not going to spend too much time. We develop a, a, a modified tensile specimen, which uh, uh, with the two slots here, and the idea is that those bundles that come through the gauge area of the of the test will be embedded in the rest of the material. Therefore, you will not lose, uh, you will not create those uh, edge effects, and therefore get better closer results to the test. However, we found that this has a consequence of, of testing locally under biaxial loading conditions, not uniaxial, which is makes also a, a big difference. And again, high-speed cameras with the 100 frames per second can give you the test. It slows down the process of damage because you have this embedded in, in angle fibers, so therefore you can uh, you can capture that um, as well, pretty, pretty uh, uh, good. Well, the uh, uh, tests that will um, eliminate any 
uh, edge effect is of course cylindrical test, so we develop a special machine, testing machine that can uh, uh, put the specimen, which is a big tube cylinder, and we can pull it and uh, twist it and uh, apply internal pressure. This is 40,000 uh, keeps uh, machine, very huge, and the um, uh, company that is making the great uh, material, which is AMP Technologies from Cincinnati, they put a lot of effort to produce the multi-layer tubes, which is task by itself uh, significant. And uh, of course, those tests are very expensive, but um, uh, can uh, produce results without any um, edge effect they for can be used to uh, validate any other type of testing which would be much simpler um, on, the, uh, on the regular um, specimen. Uh, this is showing the, some video of uh, making the uh, um, gripping area which we had to overlap with extra material and then machine it, so that, that takes a lot of time of preparation for each of the tube and you can see now the, the, the test uh, itself um, in, the ma in the machine. You can see my graduate student sitting behind and, and uh, controlling this uh, process of testing and pretty soon you can, you can see two cameras that is uh, measuring the, through DIC uh, this uh, spots that are painted on the surface of the of the specimen, and they will eventually post uh, uh, test uh, uh, post analyze you in the computer and, and show those fringes of the strains. And uh, I'm just shaking hands with my camera, uh, waiting for uh, test results um, and uh, worrying that maybe if it explodes, because it may explode, then I will be. Uh, uh, full of sharpness, <laughs> but what we what we can we do for science, right? We devote our life and and uh, make sure that we can get results. In this case, it was safe uh, because it debunked at the at the um, um, gripping area, so it didn't break, and, and the results are um, uh, need to be repeated anyway later on. So in terms of static tests, uh, this is the capabilities of our laboratory. We can do the STM standard tests or non-standard tests, but also we have the gas gun that you can see here that we can uh, we can test uh, uh, the material under the impact conditions. So uh, that will give us the larger um, um, plate that is impacted. Here it is. Um, so you can see that the gelatin is splashing into the um, um, material and we have to characterize the projectile, in this case it is uh, gelatin itself. Then we look at the um, uh, gelatin looking uh, from the DIC method and uh, then we can apply the DIC to uh, the test itself. This is. Um, interesting test because it sh will show how aluminum, the original material, will behave under uh, the gelatin, which is so-called artificial bird. While well, here you are, it, it breaks through, and not only it breaks through, but rips over a huge hole. So aluminum is, as, as um, a standard material, is very dangerous because, yes, it, it is elastic plastic, but if it breaks, it can open a significant hole in the engine and therefore uh, the, those cracks are not arrested and you can see on the left the deformation of the aluminum before it fails a little bit more higher velocity and it failed and the failure is, is definitely very detrimental. Now the composite offers more crack resistance so when you have a failure you have local fiber broke uh, breakage uh, but uh, even if you uh, have a, let me see, that would show. Even if you have the um, 
application of this material, you can see it, it is more elastic, it is gentle, uh, uh, it, it behaves like a uh, spring and therefore uh, uh, saves itself. And it was interesting to me that uh, the, the, the common sense would be that if you have thicker material, you have more protection. In fact, in composite, the thinner material, uh, to a certain extent, gives you more protection because it's more elastic and therefore the damage is not as strong and that was analyzed through all this um, um, analysis. If it fails, of course, because you can always apply force that, that will fail, uh, the damage is much more localized. Uh, it basically breaks and opens the gate and, and the projectile flies through and therefore the damage is not as, as bad um, as one would imagine. You have uh, here the whole matrix of damage and you can see that for the same fiber, just by changing the matrix, the so-called V50, which is the velocity of penetration, can be significantly different because due to the fact of um, uh, um, interface strength. In fact, the, again, the common sense would, would uh, tell us that the stronger interface, the better. In fact, in the impact, the weaker interface, the better. Because the material uh, starts to spread the forces uh, through itself by evaporating or de 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 uh, decomposing itself. And fibers are, uh, by pulling from the, from the matrix and from the other fibers, can absorb much more energy, therefore it can um, um, get much safer for the experiment that we, that we use. This is the system of uh, UMAT uh, uh, applied at the integration um, uh, method, uh, at the integration point, which basically it takes the behavior of the uh, resin and uh, failure using the micromechanical model and these are the results of the simulation with respect to experiment which are satisfactory for, for us and again you can, you can see damage model using the so-called slice um, um, uh, model that, that we use to, to incorporate and, and get the final results. Once we can uh, uh, get the results, not only for the deformation, uh, this is experiment, this is simulation, but also for the shape of failure, then we are very happy. And uh, we can start to making changes to the orientation or architecture of the, of the composite. And over here we have plus minus 60, and we have so-called butterfly shape of the damage. Here we change to plus minus 45 and completely different shape of the damage and which was predicted first and then tested and indeed it was confirmed that the damage is like that. Now the uh, re result of this is structural analysis and then 20 million dollars test can be done on a computer which is free almost because this is cost of graduate students and you know how, how little we pay graduate students for their work. So uh, it's indeed the uh, time of computers and, and, uh, uh, and, and the simulations and we can get more information from simulation than from the experiment and therefore FAA is very happy, the aircraft companies and jet engines are very happy because now they can make modification, they can come closer, they don't need to under design, over design the the, uh, uh, the, the uh, structure and they can uh, save more weight and we were able to save 30% of the weight of the jet engine uh, uh, by using this technology in, from the, in terms of um, uh, composite materials and also using our simulation method which is a big success uh, for a small uh, jet engine company like Williams they lost a uh, uh, contracts for a small uh, business like uh, airplanes because two pounds overweight of the jet engines. Uh, then they, they came to us, they used the same material for their jet engines, they save enough uh, weight and they uh, are competitive again on the market. So uh, by, by doing this we can save and, and allow companies to compete 
and uh, save billions of dollars uh, in, in terms of production of, of, the, of the long term work. Now, uh, of course, aluminum is still very used material, so the FAA uh, asked us, together with uh, NASA and the other universities, to understand um, aluminum used for the aircraft. And we found that the, the failure of uh, aluminum 2024, uh, T351, uh, error is to, should be 2024, not 14, um, uh, is, uh, uh, can be described using triaxiality um, uh, conditions, which is defined here, uh, which is the pressure P defined using the principal stresses and the von Mises stress, which is effective stress. So, uh, of course, this can be all described using invariance, and again, I'm not going to uh, put too much uh, time for the mathematics, but uh, I just want to point, point of view the triaxiality and so-called Lodi parameters, this one on Lodi angle, define this one using the uh, J3 uh, invariant uh, is used to describe the behavior of the aluminum. So all the aluminum is isotropic, but we found that based on different triaxiality, uh, it behaves uh, at a different way. And this can be uh, shown by experiments under uh, tension with uh, uh, grooves uh, on the left one to three test or punch test. And uh, you, of course, this can be done using uh, similarly like for composite using different strain rate. So what is interesting that we can see at 20 C uh, that uh, under different rate conditions, the, the, the red is the fastest that we can see that uh, when the faster we apply the loads, the stronger the material is. And also, uh, not like in composite, the maximum strain is not deteriorated, which is very, very good for, the, for aluminum. Um, um, now, also in the room, uh, for the same strain rate, but in different room temperature or, or low temperature especially, the low temperature is the blue ma minus 50 C, which is the cruise temperature of the airplane in the 30,000 feet. Uh, or room temperature, you can see that again, in the, when the colder material is, the stronger it is, and still not losing any of the strength. And we can, uh, again, observe uh, experimentally and uh, we, we develop a special specimen. This is a special specimen that um, is a punch, and that punch expands the uh, size of the specimen at the same time pushing the bottom and therefore producing the three dimensional state of stress at the bottom. Tension in X and Y uh, and uh, compression through the thickness. So this is the negative so-called Lodi parameter or Lodi angle and, tri and negative triaxiality. Now, all of that, all of these tests that are shown at the outside of the of this uh, slide are needed to produce so-called failure envelope. So this is the failure surface that that uh, for aluminum that shows how dramatically different failure can be depending on the combination of the state of stress that you apply for, the, for this material. Once uh, this material is characterized, it is put into ls as a so-called so tabulated model material 224, um, which means that the experiments are completely embedded in the, in the numerical model. And we can see that we can capture the ballistic test for different thickness of the plate on the left and compare with the experiments on the right uh, very uh, accurately. Same thing for uh, tests that are different than ballistic. And uh, I use uh, this, this material to, uh, to find out how uh, is it possible to find if it is brittle at higher velocity. So we use Sabot, uh, in, and this is our gas gun in our labora laboratory, and you can see the result of the impact when the support is accelerated in this tube and hit into the uh, impacted into a very thick uh, wall. So this is like a rigid wall at uh, speed of sound. So 
uh, it, from he, from this you can you can damage this aluminum completely to that uh, part, but there's no any brittleness. The material um, uh, basically is very plastic, uh, and uh, uh, we, we can also capture this using material two to five. So all of these tests will allow me now to go to the next step of my presentation, uh, which basically would be applied all these material models, both aluminum and um, composite, and uh, because wood is a composite material, so, so we can get the same. And at the beginning, I sh just shown this. This is a, the new Gen, Gen X engine that was produced by GE that uh, is a, uh, used as a, one of the equipment in, in addition to Rolls-Royce for the Dreamliner. So, um, a, a, and of course it is available for other airplanes as well. Uh, same material, of course, if it is good, is now uh, designed and used for helicopter shaft, so in the future will be more applications. But let's go to the problem that I, I would like to apply my knowledge, my methodology that I described here, uh, which basically um, um, is involving the crash of the uh, Polish government airplane, which happened in April 10, 2010, where the president of Poland and uh, many officials died. And I'm, I'm sure you heard about it. So, <clears throat> in a, Based on, on this uh, methodology, which uh, by, by the way was used also to analyze a uh, crash of uh, Shuttle Columbia before, and, and I knew that th this would be good methodology to use to analyze some aspects of, the, uh, of this crash. So I was waiting for the official report, and you can read in the, from the official report here, a uh, statement, section 3169, that the aircraft collided with the Birch with a triangle of diameter 30 to 40 centimeters, which led to the <coughs> left outer wing portion of about, first they say 4.7, then they measured 6.5 meters long, ripped off an intensive left bank. In five, six uh, more seconds, inverted uh, aircraft collided with the ground and was destroyed. We are talking on, on the aircraft Tupolev 154, which is similar to Boeing 727, which is about 40 meters uh, uh, wingspan and 50 meters long and uh, about 100 tons of the airplane. So uh, based on, the, on this uh, uh, reading, uh, this is about uh, six or uh, uh, five meters from the ground that uh, um, was um, uh, measured by, by the, by the uh, investigating committee. And uh, they say that the, at this location of the birch, the airplane lost wing. And of course, when they lost wing, you anticipate that the plane would lose some of the energy, right? Because they, 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 they lost balance of the lift force, so it, uh, it makes sense that it goes down. But somehow then uh, they uh, said, because of the black boxes measured the height, that the airplane uh, uh, was able to uh, go around, uh, starting to go around, without that wing, and, the, and the, at the location of um, at this location, something happened because this is the, the, the horizontal trajectory. By the way, this was supposed to be a, pra a real trajectory, but it was incorrectly directed by the ground uh, uh, navigation people and they, they directed on, on wrong path and, but, but anyway uh, something happened because the plane that was uh, flying straight turned left sharply and at this location lost all the electric power and that location you can see is about 30 meter above the ground and this is from the Russian uh, report so um, you think about this and, and, and say it doesn't make sense that an airplane that is going down without a wing, which makes sense, now is able to go up again and you calculate, you know, anybody can uh, find that the airplane is flying 80 meters per second. You can see 
the distance in meters, so you can calculate what is the change of the velocity. And you find that in this uh, location where the, you change the uh, velocity from going down to going up, you, the, the g-force has to be about 10, 10 g. So it is uh, physically impossible because even uh, fighters cannot get the g-10, right? And, and, and the big airplanes, of course, with, with g-10 would just disintegrate at that location. So you would say that, that something is, uh, is wrong. And then, um, um, you know, we, we, we are looking into this for many years, not on the us. Uh, recently, uh, uh, in Denmark, a uh, Danish uh, uh, expert, uh, Glenn uh, Jorgensen, uh, uh, made uh, um, calculations, and this information is on the YouTube. His, his lecture was in, in Denmark done in January. So you can. Uh, see that uh, what he's uh, in fact he was he had the same motivation as I, I had, which means I wanted to prove that the uh, original report is correct, and I just wanted to verify that with my methodology. And he also wanted to do that. And when uh, he put his time and I put my time, we found that the uh, report has no sense whatsoever. So what he what he's saying that uh, okay, this is the location of the Birch. And, uh, and uh, uh, let's say the, the airplane lost uh, six meters of the wing, and the whole one wing is 18 meters or 19 meters long. So six meters is about one third of the uh, of the wing, and that uh, part of the wing is uh, here. It left. It's flying from the left somehow to the right of the center of mass of the airplane and landed you know, on the in the bushes. And trees uh, and it's visible through the satellite picture. But he found also that other parts from this wing are uh, uh, in shrapnel shapes here. And this is the location of the first contact of the airplane with the ground. So the question is what could happen that the other one third of the wing is in shrapnel form uh, somewhere in the middle where the airplane was definitely flying because this is the mark where the airplane is uh, touching the ground. So, um, he also looked at the black boxes and he found that you can see in that location a little bit before first and second debris, you can have two dips of the G-force which could be related to loss of this wing and they follow us of the lift force. Um, we also found through analysis of the um, uh, satellite pictures, because I have to say that until now, it is almost four years, no a person from outside of Russia has any access to the debris of, the, of this airplane. Although it was Polish governmental airplane, but it is still in uh, Smolensk. All the black boxes are still in Moscow. And uh, um, we, nobody from outside of Russia has any access to the originals uh, and can, can get any, anything out of it. There are some parts smuggled by people, which uh, happens, but, um, but uh, officially they are not available. So what we found that uh, on the 11th of April, uh, this is the part of the stabilizer, um, and this is the location of the, of the first touch. This is the first touch of the airplane. And you can see the grooves that was done by some parts of the airplane in the ground. And uh, this part from 11 to 12 of April was moved by some unknown forces um, by 50 meters. So we asked uh, Russian, what, what has happened? And they first denied that, no, no, this, this was the original location, but when we pre presented pictures from the satellite, they eventually agreed, and they said, yeah, it was, people were trying to steal uh, those parts, and, and militia stopped them, and they dropped it here. So we asked, so why, in the official report, the new uh, uh, location is marked, not the original mark? And this, they didn't, uh, answer already because they said that this is a root of question, so uh, they don't answer to root questions. 
Uh, well, uh, you know, as to, to be limited uh, by uh, not having the access to the parts, we can rely on physics and mathematics. So what I did, I, I made the analysis using CFD uh, technique and, and allowed this uh, six meters of the wing to accelerate to a particular location in the air, and then I let it go and found so-called free uh, path of the falling down this wing. Because I, it was interesting to me how it is possible that the wing that was uh, broken on the left side can fly to the right side. Is it possible physically? And I found that, yes, it is possible. You can see this three-dimensional path, and this is the uh, location in the, uh, this is the uh, center of mass location. So it goes from the uh, location on the left and going to the right because the flight is this way. However, in order to reach this distance, the, you require a certain height of the airplane. And that height of the airplane is uh, uh, 30, about 30 meters above the ground. So then another uh, scientist found that the uh, Puffs TAWS measurements of the from the same leg was sent to be um, read in the United States, and we have access. This was one data point that we um, um, were, we had direct access, and that TAWS um, uh, gave different vertical uh, trajectory than Russian showed, and again I'm showing this, this original Russian trajectory that, that was supposed to be five meters in, near the ground, but Tufts shows that the airplane never touched this, this never hit this, this uh, tree at all. And it was uh, increasingly high, so, it, the, so the pilots said that, uh, that we are go around, we are not landing, and they started to execute this go-around decision. However, something happened later on and that disintegrated the airplane in the air. Again, coming back to uh, Jorgensen, um, it is interesting because his analysis using the aerodynamics uh, is able to uh, go back from the location of the first mark and find the trajectory and he independently confirmed that TAF's measurement is correct. So in other words, if the airplane would be at that location, the airplane would not be able to reach the final destination itself. In order to, uh, to get there, two things must happen. First of all, the airplane must be higher, and this was also compared by uh, Dr. Kowaleczko, uh, who did independent calculations, and from his calculation, there's 11.3 meters uh, above the ground, which means a way different than, than five meters or six meters than that was stated originally, which agrees, by the way, with Taft's uh, measurement. And also, uh, Jorgensen says that, that in order to make that sharp left turn, you have to lose two-thirds of the wing. So, indeed, you cannot just lose one-third of the wing, but you have to lose two-thirds uh, before the location of the, of the contact with the ground. So, all of that started to agree, no matter who did the calculation, either me in uh, Accra, or Jorgensen in Denmark, or uh, um, uh, Dr. Dabacic in Baltimore, Everything agrees. Uh, however, nothing agrees with the official report that was that was uh, presented to the nation, to the world. So um, again, you can study more the uh, available uh, uh, pictures from the satellite. Right now, you can buy satellite pictures for a couple of hundred dollars. Anybody, you can buy and you, from from uh, commercial satellites. And you can see the uh, satellite picture um, the, the, in April 2010. Uh, this is still spring. And then in June 2010, and 
interesting. This is the location of called TAS 38. This is the location where the airplane turned sharply left. First of all, this TAS 38 was hidden in the official report. You cannot find it. You can download the report from internet. And you can find that this task 38 is not there. However, if you are smart in computers and you take the PDF, you can open it, okay? Because it was put a, a green square on top of task 38 because they didn't like it. Because the, the, the task 38 not only shows that something over there happened, but that the plane flew straight. And if it flew straight, it means it couldn't lose the wing at the birch tree. It must be somewhere else. So uh, that agrees with the, the Dr. Szlajinski, who is an uh, expert in explosives, and uh, uh, he's, he's the alumni of the uh, uh, airplane um, uh, uh, department of the Polish Warsaw Technical University, uh, that the, there has to be explosive in the wing that caused the middle part to deteriorate to the pieces and therefore that one third was just fly away due to the being not connected anymore to the air, airplane. And that happened in, in for most likely in this location of TAS 38. This is why it was hidden in the official report. Uh, not only it was hidden, but also uh, Russian did some uh, uh, work over there, they cut all the trees and all the bushes and remove uh, about two meters of ground uh, from that location. You can see from satellite picture. And again, we asked them, why, why did you do that? They said, well, because we didn't want next airplane to hit those trees and to have another crash. So we asked, okay, but you left all these trees here and they can be, uh, 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 so they said that it's a rude question and they are not going to answer. <laughs> but interesting also is that uh, you can see here this is the location of that birch tree and according to the uh, uh, Russian report this airplane is supposed to be here uh, two meters or maybe one meter above the ground. So you can imagine that all these bushes and trees should be shaved, okay? It should not be there, but they are there in June, so obviously this is not enough time to grow again uh, the tree. So that also confirms that the uh, uh, so-called uh, tree, uh, birch tree, is not the cause of the crash. So coming back to my methodology, you know, I, I, as, as, as engineer, I can uh, build a model, and so this is a model of uh, Tupolev 154. You have some measurements. You can see the yellow uh, trunk of the tree uh, according to the uh, uh, official report, which is the uh, input data, right? I, I also have to give the properties of the uh, material. So, I, uh, uh, Professor Cieszewski from the University of Georgia, he received part of this tree from Smolensk and he tested it and he found that indeed this is a regular uh, birch tree, it's not anything stronger than any other birch tree. And in fact, it's weaker because it is uh, growing in the very wet area and therefore it has a lot of uh, water inside of itself. And uh, I was able to put together the properties and, and the uh, dimensions of this tree. You can see how many uh, stems, knots are uh, in the area of crash, and all every knot is the weakness of the tree. So um, some of the experts from Canada said that this tree, in fact, is so weak that uh, at that velocity, uh, if uh, a person would hit the tree, it would break. Uh, you don't need the airplane. But anyway, you can see the tree itself, how it is broken and how, why it was uh, uh, given the uh, reason that, that, that this, uh, this massive airplane lost its wing on this, uh, on this tree because it is broken. Uh, so what I did as an engineer and scientist can do, I, I bought some of the birch tree and I tested and I uh, uh, created a model, an autotropic model in this case, of course, and you can see that before my test I, I used linear model 
which uh, gave the properties that I took from the literature. Uh, but then when I tested, uh, I saw that this material is more nonlinear, and I used material 143, which is part of the uh, newer nonlinear material model available for the um, trees. Uh, independently, uh, Professor uh, Bocieri in California did uh, use the same material model 143 for testing of this uh, experiment. You can see constellation airplane, which is uh, much older. This, this test was done in 65, and two um, uh, poles, electric poles, are cut by the wing of this of this airplane. So the um, airplane, incidentally, is much lighter, it's uh, half of the weight of the Tupolev, f and therefore, as, as anybody that, that designed airplanes, you know that you design wings according to the velocity of the airplane and its weight. Uh, so if your objective is to have an airplane that is flying much slower, which was the, in the case of lacking a constellation uh, and much lighter, then the wing must be much lighter and weaker as well. In fact, it doesn't have, um, it has only two spars, front and back, and has, rib, uh, um, uh, has the truss instead of ribs. So uh, it's very light structure, and in, in, indeed, if, uh, despite of the fact that this wing is much weaker, both of those poles were cut uh, without any problem. As you can see, the breeze flying through uh, through that through that wing. Uh, of course, this experiment was not designed to uh, produce data for a c crash of the airplane 30 years later, but uh, or 40 or uh, 50 years later. But but it was done to analyze the spillage of the fuel. So they uh, put more uh, obstacles, the, the ground obstacles and, and big stones to, di to rip off this wing to spill the fuel, to measure the fuel. And, and this the report of this test is in the internet of Bocieri. You can look into Bocieri's. And he used the same methodology as I did. So although we don't know each other personally, but we use the same uh, methodology because it is uh, available. Now, for the aluminum, uh, we use first, uh, you know, non uh, bilinear material model. We use Johnson Cook, which is a train rate dependent model. And recently, we use this tabulated model, which is the most um, accurate that, that I uh, already shown before here. So, um, Now, uh, what is interesting is that this test that I, that I mentioned uh, proves that this material is very plastic. But if you look into the field of debris, you have uh, thousands. In fact, uh, we got the report recently uh, done by archaeologists that they measured, they found 30,000 of debris in certain area, not the full area. And the debris are uh, already found before this birch tree. Uh, uh, so how the, uh, you can find the debris of the, uh, from the airplane before first contact with any tree. And, and also from the location of the tree all the way it is rain of parts. As, as I showed you, the, this wing part, the second uh, two-thirds of the part. And, the debris at the location are uh, shown here through this satellite picture. Well, uh, Dr. Szladzinski says that uh, the more debris you can get, the higher energy is involved during the uh, damage. So uh, we calculated, of course, and uh, due to the fact that airplane was flying 80 meters per second, which is 270 kilometers per hour, which is not high velocity for the airplane, and uh, landed uh, from only 30 meters, uh, the energy is not sufficient to de disintegrate the airplane to small pieces of that nature, unless it was explosive. So the conclusion was that, that there, there must be explosive involved and also, as I mentioned, some of the parts were smuggled out of Russia. 
you can, they don't let us have, but uh, somebody brave enough brought this piece uh, from the wing, and you can see the typical damage from the pressure inside of the wing. You can see ripped of the rivets and a uh, small internal part of the, of the shiny uh, part of the wing. So this is a proof that there was explosion in the wing. Um, again, if you look into the stress strain uh, of, of, the, of different models that we used, like Johnson Cook, Cook or Bilinear or this tabulated together with the uh, uh, material model used for the wood, gener generic orthotropic model or material 143, but if you need to squash this to this level to, to show you the same vertical uh, scale, you can see how weak the tree is in comparison with aluminum. I don't know if you uh, saw, and I hope you saw, uh, the airplanes that hit the World Trade Center the September 11 uh, during the uh, terrorist attack, and the airplane went inside of the building. The outside of the World Trade Center, there are steel columns. So the aluminum was able to cut through the steel columns, and that paper is uh, written by uh, Tomasz Wierzbicki and available uh, from MIT and available on the internet. So you can read how it is possible that aluminum, which is one third of the strength of the steel, can cut at certain velocity the steel columns. So of course, if the aluminum can cut steel columns, which is three times stronger than aluminum, why there's any problem to cut the tree? This is the comparison in one scale of tabulated model and large tree. So again, uh, coming back to our model, we use a um, uh, structure of the tuple F-154, but we didn't use so-called stringers uh, because I wanted to have my wing weaker. To be sure, to be more conservative, I wanted to have my wing weaker and I used uh, three stronger, no knots, no, um, about four times stronger than really it is. Uh, because I don't trust the uh, initial condition data, then I use so-called parametric uh, conditions, uh, initial conditions to change the velocity vectors from 77 to 80 meters per, se per second horizontal, from 0 to 90 meters per second vertical, with the known uh, mass of the airplane uh, the batch density I changed from 700 to 1,000 kilogram per meter cube, and uh, I changed the location of the uh, contact between virgin and the wing, and different for the, all of that for different uh, horizontal um, pitch and uh, roll angles as shown in here. My colleague uh, from University of Akron, Dr. Jack Brown. He uh, is an uh, expert in aerodynamics. He used uh, ANSYS CFX and calculated aerodynamic pressures. So we put those pressures on top of our loading conditions. And therefore, we can show the simulations, uh, how the computer predicts uh, what would happen if this airplane would hit that birch tree. Again, assuming that, that I follow the official uh, report. So what you can see that in each case for every orientation of the airplane uh, the, basically the front edge is damaged but then the edge is uh, cut by the uh, wing and the airplane is flying away very quickly. We, we, the whole um, uh, event takes two hundredths of a second. Okay flight is 80 meters per second, so within one second the, flight, the airplane goes 80 meters, right? So the contact with the birch before it is broken to pieces is just 200 of a second. It's very quick, very dynamic um, uh, situation. So you can see in every case, for every model, uh, some of them are more linear, more non-linear, but you have the same effect, the, the, the birch tree, uh, is broken and it falls, the, the upper part, due to dynamics, has to fall in the direction of the flight. 
Okay, there's no other way. Uh, this, is, this was also proven by Bacelli experiment. What is interesting is that in small lengths, the bird is laying perpendicular to the direction of the flight, which cannot be uh, explained physically at all. I look from the bottom of the uh, surface of the uh, wing and I can see that there's no contact between the uh, lower part of the tree, uh, again because it's so much inertia involved in a dynamic event that the, the, the wing has to uh, just cut by, uh, uh, has to cut this tree and, uh, and go away. So, but the, the, always the front edge is damaged. So no matter what, the front edge is damaged. I did calculations for different thicknesses of spars, different thicknesses of ribs and skin of the airplane. And um, in every scenario I calculated, I had the same results that the airplane, if it would hit really this tree, the, the, the tree would be cut in half, should fall down in the direction of the, uh, uh, of the flight of the airplane. Um, but in fact, it is not the case. The, if you look at the debris and put together and reconstruct the, the airplane wing, this is the part that was flying away, but the front edge is not damaged. This, this is supposed to be damaged part when the tree is supposed to cut through the airplane. But the, wing, the, the slots, so-called, you can see they are not damaged in that location. However, you have a big hole here. So how you can rip the big hole in the middle of the wing without uh, damaging the front edge? Definitely not by tree, but yes, you can do it if you have explosion in this area. Then this part is just flying away because it's not connected to anything. Professor Cieszewski also recently did a, um, bought some of the satellite pictures again and um, he found the location of that tree uh, with respect to other objects. This is the magnification of the tree from the 12th of April and 11th of April that we know it's broken. So uh, through the um, low resolution, unfortunately, satellite picture, you can see the white spot of the trunk uh, of the birch tree, which is white. And in January 26, Six, this tree was standing. You can, you, he, he is the forester, he is the expert to read from the satellite pictures. He did it together with his colleagues in University of Georgia, and all five professors agreed that this is a standing tree and this is not, this is broken tree. So here the, the, you don't see any white because the trunk looking from, uh, I mean the, bird, uh, the branches looking from the top, the trunk you don't see it, it's all dark. So then he found the picture from April 5, and he asked audience, is that same location from April 5 similar to these pictures or similar to this? What is your vote? Who, who believes that this is the same as this two? Raise your hand. Okay, who believes that this is the same as this? Raise your hand. Okay, you, you're right. Okay, uh, so it means the conclusion is that on April 5, which is five days before the crash, the tree is broken. Of course, uh, the official Russian uh, uh, says, no, this picture is the same as this. So, you are wrong. Sorry. Well, uh, I also did some simulations of a fuselage that is dropping down uh, upside down, so you can see red wall, uh, floor of the fuselage, and no matter how I drop this fuselage um, uh, with the angle of rotation or without, either one wall or, or the other wall and ceiling is uh, broken under the floor. But uh, people from Sandia National Lab did the same calculations or, or uh, calculation or behavior of fuselage what would happen? How this fuselage would behave if you apply explosives inside? Uh, so uh, this is this is uh, uh, shown the results in 2008 by Sandia National Lab, and the pressure from explosive rips the fuselage 
and opens this outside. So if you have explosion in the air, you rip off the fuselage axially and the ceiling and wall goes on both sides of the airplane. So this is one of the debris of the fuselage in the uh, smallest. You can see the floor, this is the floor, this is the bottom of the airplane, this is one wall, this is another wall and ceiling. So that to me represents the situation that was done by Sandia National Lab, not the one that I did it before when I crashed uh, 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 this, this particular uh, fuselage without explosives. So I did explosives as well, upside down, and indeed you can see that the ceiling and wall goes on one side and the other wall goes on the other side. And then you have this situation as captured by the uh, photographs of the debris um, in Smolensk. The last analysis that I did was, okay, uh, I, I'm, I'm a stubborn person, so I, I, I want to do all the uh, calculations based on the official report, official report that says that the airplane lost on the wing, and its whole mass hit the soft ground because there was very soft, uh, wet um, uh, floor uh, without any stones and any, any bricks and any, any, uh, any rocks. So my simulations of the f whole mass of the airplane depending on the angle of heat with the 80 meters per second produces the a crater, okay? Um, again, you know, you are talking about 78 tons of mass hitting 80 meters per second in the soft ground. It's normal that you can expect a crater. So uh, the crater should be about one, two meter deep and, uh, uh, you know, the, the width should be bigger than the width of the fuselage or maybe even bigger than fuselage and wings and uh, it should uh, be very long. Uh, depending on the orientation, it could be very long, more than 100 meters long. Um, I did this uh, with the airplane uh, downing um, uh, with the wheel, uh, wheels down, and uh, later on uh, uh, it was shown experiment using Boeing 727, and uh, Boeing 727 is very similar to uh, uh, Tupolev, you can see both uh, dimensions and uh, weights in the table um, uh, shown in the, over here. So any accidents using Boeing 707 are, are very interesting. This is the one of the report of the JFK crash when the airport uh, when the airplane Boeing 707 hit the lighting towers uh, in 1975 with the left wing. You can see that uh, it, uh, uh, the airplane contacted the top of the number seven approach light tower at the elevation of 27 feet above the mean low water level and 2,400 feet from the threshold of the runway 22L. The aircraft continued and struck towers eight and nine. The aircraft left wing was damaged severely by impact with these towers. The outboard section was seen severed. The aircraft uh, then rolled into steep left bank well in axis of 90 degrees. It contacted the ground and the fuselage struck five uh, other towers. The aircraft then continued to uh, street where the, it came to rest. The approach light tower and large uh, boulders along the uh, latter portion of the path caused the fuselage to collapse and disintegrate a fire had erupted after the left wing failed. Okay. So it is kind of similar scenario and that was presented by Russians. However, you can read also from the newspapers that um, in this plane, despite of the fact that it hit those uh, multiple towers, um, some people survived. 109 of 1,122 uh, plane feared that. So, uh, about 11 people survived, including two children. You can see how these uh, towers look. These are not just a pole, easy to cut. These are steel 
structures, like uh, truss structures, and one of them is completely cut in half by the wing of this airplane. <coughs> Uh, you can see the boulders over here and, and how uh, uh, big boulders uh, disintegrated this airplane, but uh, seats of the airplane are still intact. Well, if you compare with the Tupolev of 154, there was no boulder, there was no tower, there was just one tree, and all the uh, airplane is disintegrated to pieces, including seats. There are no one seat that is intact. This is the, another experiment done by, Tupol, uh, by Boeing 727, uh, done in 2012, uh, where it was uh, equipped with um, uh, dummies and sensors without any human being inside, and the objective was to cause the explosion of this airplane. The airplane hits with the higher velocity, the vertical velocity than, than the Tupolev, uh, and it breaks to three pieces. Of course, if you are a human being and you are flying in business class, I'm sorry, you are dead. <laughs> but if you will be sitting in the middle or uh, aft part of the airplane, you will survive. Despite of the fact that this was a very bad uh, crash, you will survive. The accelerations are such that you will have some broken ribs, but you will survive. Well, that uh, experiment validated my, my simulations, which was done before, and my simulation also broke into three pieces. So I could uh, now make a simulation with upside-down configuration, and I found that accelerations inside of this airplane are lower if it uh, hits upside-down than if it would hit um, with the regular way. The reason is that the it has this uh, uh, tail and engines, and those tails and engines, each engine is 9,000 uh, kilograms. Uh, it's a lot of metal, and that, that absorbs the energy before the fuselage is in contact, the aft part of the fuselage is in contact with the ground. So again, people in the front will die, but the, uh, the aft people should survive. Unfortunately, in Tupolev 154, everybody died. Not only died, but uh, people were, um, many people were uh, basically found in pieces. One of the family uh, uh, member told me that she received in the uh, coffin on the hand of her husband. We don't know where is the rest. So uh, we made simulations. You can see how this crater and the disintegration of the airplane happens if it is flying upside down. Uh, you know, these are all very expensive simulations. It, it takes uh, months of calculations on a good computer to get uh, results because of, of the ex ex um, explicit nature of the of the uh, calculations. What is interesting that uh, in this case we found that at least one wing should survive. There's no reason that uh, both wings would be damaged. You know, one was damaged because of the tree, but why the other is damaged, there's no, no reason whatsoever. Now, in the official report, the, uh, it says that the wing, that the airplane really hit uh, not upside down completely, but kind of on the left wing, on the broken wing. So, in fact, this is even better, uh, more, giving more survival uh, chances for the airplane. And again, we can show the results of Sioux City, Iowa uh, case, where the airplane uh, hit the ground on the wing, uh, rotated you know, many times, disintegrated to pieces, landed ev eventually upside down, and you can see people walking outside from the middle part of the fuselage, or the fuselage is disintegrated into big chunks uh, of the airplane. Again, you can see seats are in good shape, okay? And if people are there, they are also there, but they look like people, not like a piece of meat. Cases where the airplane landed upside down, in this case it was Kyrgyzstan, 
apparently Russian likes to land upside down, and in this case, you have all survived 31 injured. Uh, this is the same airplane to Polar 154, uh, landed in the uh, forest, disintegrated uh, into uh, three pieces again, uh, cut through forest, didn't lose any wing, but uh, just sheared uh, hundreds of hundreds of, of trees without any problem, and people uh, get outside, uh, it was uh, in the moment of, of this crash, 83 people were injured, all survived. Later on, two people died in the hospital. Well, this is what has left from this air, airplane, uh, which you can see at the tarmac of the Smolensk um, airport. So this is the left wing, but look at the right wing. It's also damaged completely. Look at the fuselage. Uh, well, uh, the, the wing, the, the tail was found before before the contact of the airplane. So all of that can be um, summarized. Okay, that's one more picture to, to show. This is this birch, and and uh, before birch are the, the parts of the of this airplane, and all you can see all these parts that are shown here uh, along the way of flight of the airplane. This is this is the part that is hanging. Before that birch, you can see the distance between birch before. So how how that thing would fly after hitting the birch backwards, uh, I cannot figure it out. Uh, so uh, basically, the conclusions can be that a separation of one third of the wing could not cause uh, by the impact with the birch tree. Most probably separation of a fragment of the wing was caused by explosion in the air. Lack of visible crater at the crash scene, a large field of debris indicated the airplane disintegrated, disintegrated in the mid-air. And then those parts, not as a one mass, but as a rain of parts, fall, fell down there for the didn't create any crater. Open walls outside of the fuselage indicate mid-air explosion. The unprecedented degree of damage and the large number of sharpeners indicate high energy mid air explosion. Without the mid air explosion, most of the passengers in the center and in the aft section of the airplane should survive any crash from 30 to 40 meters into the soft soil. Official Russian report attributes death of the passengers to 100 G acceleration. Such acceleration could be explained by explosion in the fuselage, shockwave produced by explosion, and direct impact of the passengers with the ground at 80 meters per second without any protection of the fuselage. And this is all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, we'll just take a couple of questions if anybody's got any questions there in the audience. Anybody have a question there? The one question I would like to ask, just very simply, is uh, I know with regard to Boeing 727s, there are designed production breaks within the fuselage which will cause it to split into three. I just wonder, does the Tupolev have a similar sort of structure in, in terms of the way it's designed? Yeah, Tupolev is much stronger. It has three spars, not two spars. Uh, the, the reason is that technology in Russia is not as uh, precise as it is in the Western countries, and therefore they produce first the same with two spars, but they found that they have too much uh, deformation of the wing, and they uh, equipped the, the third spar into the uh, 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 wing of the airman. So it's about 30% stronger. Great, thank you. Any, other, any questions there from anybody? Uh, if there isn't, I'd just like to call on Tom Corrigan for a second, just to say a few words. And while he's getting his way up here, I'd just like to remind anybody who's in the Royal Aeronautical Society or who's not in the Royal Aeronautical Society, there is a talk on the beach launching of gliders from Kerry Beaches and basically mountain uh, ridge soaring on Wednesday night in Winds Hotel at 7 o'clock. You don't have to be a member to attend, it's free and it's worth coming just to hear how people in our industry and in the sport and in our industry like to do what they do. So I just call my Tom now, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, first of all, can I say
to echo, I should say, Paul's welcome to the professor, to the Royal Aeronautical Society, and to the Polish discussion group. Uh, DIT and the Royal Aeronautical Society go back many, many years. And in our history, back in 2011, when this building was actually built, we did have lectures on aircraft construction. So we're, we're embedded in our aviation here down through the years. Um, I have to say that I intended to take notes and be able to respond to things that were said, but I got engrossed in your, in your lecture so much that I put the pen down and just said, I'm going to listen to this. Uh, I was particularly interested in uh, the development of the materials, of course, and how they're now um, implemented. And one question that I should have uh, responded to Paul's request was, how repairable are those materials now? No problem? Um, yeah, we have a big problem with repair of composites, yes. This is still ongoing research and uh, any students who are working here in, in Ireland can pick up that, that question. Uh, obviously we have some glues and we can, uh, one of the colleagues here he pointed out to have very strong glue, uh, so we can use uh, the uh, um, composite by, by ba ba basically retrofitting and uh, adding to it by using strong adhesives. We don't know how they age, how they behave in the conditions of the flight. Uh, there's a lot of mm, questions. Fortunately, so far we have no damage to the uh, composite Airbus or composite Boeing yet. But these problems will come, so it, it is a good moment to start thinking about it for students. You can be a, a very a, a look after expert if you have any experience in repairing of composites in aircraft. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. When you moved on to your in press investigation, it, as you discussed it and as you talked about it, it took me back to a situation where we had an air crash back in the late 1960s, where we had a Viscount, Aer Lingus had a Viscount that crashed off Tusker Rock, and we were ably assisted by our colleagues across the water. And it also left that kind of doubt as to why did they assist, what really happened, and what was the true outcome. Perhaps if we had had your models back then, we could have come to maybe a different conclusion, or at least challenged the conclusion that actually did arrive. So with that, I, I won't hold anybody else up again. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Paul. And thank you to the uh, Polish community. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention this morning. Thank you.